Great. So um, let's see if this will work here. Hmm. Could have had that playing before, sorry. All right. So um, like I said, I want to talk about live cell imaging today. And live cell imaging, there's obviously a lot more to consider. Um, we have to make sure that your sample's alive and happy while it's on the microscope. So I want to go through a few things today. Um, I want to talk a bit about temperature, obviously. Most of the things, many of the things that we look at don't um, usually live at room temperature, especially the room temperature of the HCBI, which is usually ridiculously cold. Um, so we have to think about some way to keep our sample at the temperature that it would um, most like to be at. Uh, biological things do not like to dry out. So this usually means keeping them in a humid environment, um, which the HCBI is usually not a humid environment, except on a rainy day in the summer. Um, we have to worry about the pH of our media. So if things get too basic or too acidic, that's gonna affect our sample. So we need to be able to maintain a stable pH in our sample, which we usually do with certain buffers in our media and, and by pumping CO2 into our sample. Um, and then, there's some other things that we need to think about as well um, that are sort of outside of the usual biological realm. So um, obviously we're not used to um, dumping copious amounts of light on living things unless you're trying to treat COVID-19 under the recommendations of the president. Um, so we have to worry about these two items of photo bleaching and phototoxicity which I think these often get confused. So um, I wanna spend a little bit of time uh, just pointing out that they're different and how we can try to avoid them. So there's a lot of things to get through. Um, I've divided it up into four little segments here. So we're gonna talk about the equipment, the actual microscopes we use and the peripheral add-ons that we need uh, for our microscopes. We'll talk a little bit about sample prep, how we mount, these samples, because um, that's a little bit different. Talk about choosing the right microscope and some of the options in the HCBI, and then we'll talk a bit about imaging parameters and um, how they can improve the happiness of your, of your samples, um, but also some of the trade-offs that that might result in as far as temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and, and signal to noise in your images. Well, so let's start with equipment. So here's a really simple um, live cell setup. I guess it's not simple, but um, I have our standard inverted microscope in the middle here. And uh, the first thing you notice is this big plexiglass box around the outside. So you've probably seen these in the HCBI. So we have one on our 880, we have one on the new Alira, except it's black. And these are just, um, like I said, a big plexiglass box. And in the back, there's this big black tube that comes in and it's coming off a, a heater and a fan down here. So that just blows hot air into the microscope and warms up the environment in here. Um, these are pretty good, um, but you need more than, than just that alone. So we usually have a few other components. Um, one of those is the heated stage. Um, so you can see this one up in the top left here. The, we have a lid on there. Um, let's bring in CO2 and humidified air. We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, the lid sits on top of the sample. And what you can't really see is underneath that lid is a stage insert that's a big heavy piece of block of metal. Uh, and that also has a heater inside it as well. So that entire stage that's actually touching your sample holder is heated as well. Um, so like I said, coming in through this tube, we've got humidified air, um, which is the air first gets bubbled through this um, bottle here that has distilled water in it. It has this little, uh, it's sitting inside this container, which is also a heater, so it heats up all the water inside that 
uh, bottle. So that's already nice and warm once it um, once the air in there gets into your stream, going out to your stage. And underneath that bottle, we have a CO2 mixer. So what this does is it takes the room air and mixes it with CO2 that's coming from one of our tanks out in the hallway. Um, and it mixes that to whatever percentage you set it to, which is usually 5%. It mixes that air before it bubbles it through the bubble here and goes into our stage. Okay. And the last thing I want to point out is where this red arrow goes. Um, and it's actually not there in this picture, but most of our microscopes have a little black box on the side here, and that's our automatic focus unit. So that's gonna allow us to compensate for any thermal drift that may occur while we're imaging. So these are the sort of the basic components um, of a good live cell imaging setup. And so just to start off, I just wanna introduce you to uh, some of the systems that we have at the HCBI. And I'm gonna kind of, I guess, go from simplest to most complex to some degree. So the first system that we do a lot of our live cell work on is the cell discoverer. Uh, so this is the big box that sits in the back corner of the facility. And this, is, uh, this system really excels at looking at thin samples, so especially monolayers of cells. So up at the top here, you can see a couple of wound, he wound healing assays um, that are going on just with transmitted light. And then over to the left here, this is um, an immune assay where we've got killer T cells in orange that are trying to eat the green cells around there. Um, so this works really well for thin samples, monolayers of cells. Uh, it's great for doing really fast imaging, especially multi-color imaging. Um, we have some multi-bandpass filter cubes on there so you can image these two channels almost simultaneously. Um, and it's also excellent if you're imaging in multi-well plate formats. Um, so it can do anything from a six well plate to a 384 well plate or, or even higher than that in a nice automated fashion. Uh, so inside the microscope in the back here, um, what you do is you put your plate or your sample here, it takes it into the microscope. And then there's a little chamber at the back here that's fully environmentally controlled. So it's heated. Uh, we blow some humidified air into it. There's a water bottle down here that supplies that humidified air. And over on this side, there's a CO2 mixer um, that mixes our CO2 and blows that in and on our sample as well. So very easy to keep samples nice and happy in here. Sorry, this doesn't go from least complicated to most complicated. It goes from thinnest sample to thickest sample. So. Uh, the next one that I want to talk about is our new Alira 7 system. Uh, so this is what it looks like here. Um, probably some of you have seen it. Hopefully a few of you have tried it out as well. Um, now, unlike our old Alira, this one actually does have um, full live cell imaging capabilities. So we have the box around the outside here to keep our sample nice and warm. We have the um, lids for inside of our sample for over top of our um, plate holder or sample holder that will bring in our humidified air and our CO2. Uh, so again, this is good for thin samples. They don't have to be as thin as the cell discoverer because we do have the ability to do some optical sectioning techniques here, either apatome or lattice sim. Uh, this is really great for fast imaging. This can go incredibly fast as shown in the uh, little video here of mitochondria and ER. Uh, system can also do turf imaging. So if you're only interested in looking at a few nanometers in from the um, cover slip, we can do that in turf mode. And it's also going to, it's also a super resolution system. So we can use it in the structured illumination mode to get a little extra resolution. Um, of course, we have our LSM 880s that we're able to use. So the LSM 880 plus Airy scan, uh, this system has the uh, fully heated box, it has the heated stage insert, CO2, humidified air, everything like that. So this is a, a full live cell incubation system. Uh, 
Uh, again, because these are point scanning confocals, they're best for thick samples, so you don't have to worry about out of focus light. But because they're a point scanner, they're a little bit slower. So these work better on slower moving objects, um, not necessarily the best option for something like a really fast moving endosome. Uh, these are also going to give you the best contrast in those thick samples because it's easy for the system to um, filter out that out of focus light. I also threw an image of one of our upright 880s on here. Um, the reason I did that is we definitely do have people doing live cell imaging on these, but it's usually live organism imaging. So uh, something like a zebrafish or maybe a cricket embryo or a Drosophila embryo, something that doesn't need um, as much uh, environmental control. So it doesn't need CO2, it doesn't need humidified air. Um, we do have some heated stage inserts that we will put on these microscopes. We just have a portable one that we can move around to different scopes. Uh, and we'll put those on the upright systems for, for people who need it. Um, so not as flexible, but still often used for, for live sample imaging as well. And finally, we have our light sheet. Um, so again, the system's used for thick samples, for example, the zebrafish embryo over here on the right. Um, and it can go much quicker than our point scanning confocals. So anything that has some really fast dynamics um, are, is ideally suited to the light sheet. Um, inside the light sheet here, we have a fully environmentally controlled chamber. And with our newest version that we put in last summer, we actually do have CO2 control on the system now too. We didn't have that before, um, but we do now. So if anyone is trying to do some mammalian imaging of something living, like maybe like an organoid or something like that, um, we do have the ability to pump in CO2 and, and keep that pH um, nice and happy inside. All right, so those are the options in the HCBI for, for live cell imaging. Now when you're getting ready to start a live cell imaging experiment, uh, you often have to, if you're used to doing fixed cell work, you really need to reconsider your sample prep. And the first thing you've got to figure out is how you're going to mount that sample. And there's a ton of options here. Um, this is just an introduction to a few of them, but we have our standard um, tissue culture multi-wall plates. I'll tell you in a second why those might not be the best option. You can of course get these with these cover slip bottoms down in the bottom. Uh, you can get 35 millimeter dishes with a cover slip bottom. And then you can get into some more elaborate systems. Um, one that we often see are these chambered cover glasses. So these are the Lab Tech 2 system from Thermo Fisher. Uh, these are really good. It's just a cover slip that's stuck to the bottom of this plastic um, multi-chamber system. So these can come in single chambers, double chambers, all the way up to eight. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that even if you get these eight chambered ones, usually the four middle ones are really the only ones you can use before your objective gets dangerously close, close to the stage. Um, the other thing is to make sure you know the difference between the chambered cover glass and the chambered cover slide. So with the chambered cover glass, you have a cover slip stuck to the bottom. With the chambered cover slide, you have a microscope slide stuck to the bottom. And these aren't um, of much use because that's a millimeter thick piece of glass, which none of our high resolution objectives have the working distance to look through. Uh, so you really don't want to use these. Even um, we have people that will um, culture cells in these. So even for fixed cell assays, you don't want to use these. People will culture cells in them and then you pull off these chambers and stick a cover slip on top. The problem is, is that there's still this um, sort of glue or some sort of membrane that's left behind. And that actually get, has your cover slip sitting so high that the working distance of the really high resolution objectives, like a 1.4 NA objective, uh, it doesn't have the working distance to get to your cells. You've also put this big layer of mounting media in between, that gives you a big refractive index mismatch. So you usually don't get very nice images off of these. So no matter whether you're doing fixed cell or live cell, stay away from these chambered cover slides. <laughs> 
Uh, the other option that I've seen a few people using, uh, I've seen these homemade as well, is this idea of you take um, some sort of base that you can get a round cover slip to fit into it. Uh, usually you put the cover slip down and then put a rubber O-ring on top of it and then screw in this insert in the top of it. And that makes a nice sealed bottom. And these are great because they're obviously reusable and it's really cheap to buy cover slips. So this is a much more economical system than buying these little 35 millimeter dishes, which for some reason are insanely expensive. Um, so I really like these systems here. Just another little word about multi-well plates. So uh, on the last slide, I showed you the standard tissue culture plates. Those usually have um, somewhere between one and two millimeter thick bottom. Uh, it's usually a polystyrene bottom. And that is very difficult to image through. So again, you're usually limited to uh, only the lowest resolution objectives, really long working distance objectives, and you can't get high quality images through them. But you can get multi-well plates that have thin bottoms. Um, and so ideally you want this to be as close to a number 1.5 cover slip as possible. So around 170 microns uh, or micrometers. Usually these are like, they're usually never exactly 170. It's usually a plus or minus of like 20, 30 micrometers. Um, but they come in three different types. So you can get glass bottoms, which are, uh, it's just a really big piece of cover slip stuck to the bottom. Those ones give you the flattest bottom, which is really great if you're trying to automate imaging across an entire well. Uh, they are the most expensive low. So another option are plastic ones. Um, so this is usually from a company called Abidi uh, that has this optically clear plastic, thin plastic. And uh, cells really like those bottoms. So often uh, our stem cell people really enjoy using those uh, well plates because those cells that are sometimes hard to grow on glass are usually happy in the plastic. And then the other option is a polymer film. Um, so polymer films are usually the cheapest option and um, they work pretty well as well. They usually just aren't quite as flat, um, but the cells usually tend to like sticking to them uh, as well. All of these can be ordered coated with fibronectin or poly -L lysine, or you can obviously do that yourself if, if you want to. Yeah. Another really important thing to think about is the medium. Um, that you're going to bring your sample in when you come to image it in the facility. Um, so, uh, especially cell culture media is very autofluorescent. And there's two components that contribute to that. One is the phenol red. So that's that pH indicator that gives your media that red color. And then the other is any sort of serum that you add to it. The protein in that serum is often very autofluorescent. Um, so these are things to think about. Um, any media that you buy for imaging comes in a phenol red free version. Um, and you can also get some that don't use carbonate buffer, that will use a HEPES buffer instead. So if you use a HEPES buffered media instead of a carbonate buffer, then you don't need to be pumping CO2 into your system and worrying about the, the pH changing over time. So this is just one example from Thermo Fisher of a live cell imaging medium that they make. Um, and this one is a HEPES based buffer with no phenol red in it. As far as the serum, just try and add as little as you need to to keep everything happy. Um, so sometimes you can get away with going to a lower serum concentration and, and your cells will still be happy depending on how long your experiment's gonna be for. Okay. Um, one other thing I'll point out too is there's a bunch of live cell imaging additives that you can add uh, to your buffer. And these are to prevent um, bleaching while you're imaging. So we'll talk about bleaching in a bit and why it's uh, a big deal in live cell imaging. but uh, essentially, just like you have anti-fade agents that you can add to um, fixed cell mounting media, there are some that you can also add to your live cell imaging media. Uh, 
And these are usually just antioxidants. So it's usually some vitamin E or, or some sort of derivative similar to that uh, that can be added to sort of scavenge up any reactive oxygen species that, that are in your media. Cool. All right, so you've picked out your microscope, you've figured out how you're gonna mount your sample, you've got your media all set, um, but hopefully before you did all of that, you thought a bit about how you're gonna image them, what kind of stain you're gonna use. So for live cell imaging, we're predominantly using fluorescent protein tags. Um, these are, I think you all know, genetically encoded proteins. Uh, they're originally found in jellyfish, but now they come from corals, and I think even some from the bacteria world now. Um, that can be genetically encoded and introduced into your sample. Uh, some of the other options that, that we see are um, antibodies that are conjugated to a fluorophore, and these antibodies bind to extracellular epitopes, so on the outside of the cell, and then you can watch some traffic into the cell. Um, you can also do fluorescently tagged ligands, so same thing, let's say you have a receptor tyrosine kinase on your surface, you can stick a fluorophore to the ligand for that receptor and watch it be taken in and taken up. And uh, we also have a bunch of cell permeum cell permeant small molecule fluorophores. And these are kind of in two groups. Um, so one group is just standard organic dyes that are cell permeant. And we put some sort of um, chemistry on them that will attract them to a specific tag within our cells. So these are the snap clip tags. I think I got a slide about this later. Um, but it's also other small molecules like, um, uh, for example, the Hooks dye or Hush dye um, that can pass through a, a plasma membrane and, and stain your nucleus. Um, so similar to DAPI, except DAPI will not pass through a, a live cell membrane, so you can't use that in your live cell imaging. So on the topic of fluorescent proteins, if you're at the point where you're sort of beginning your project um, and you have the ability to choose what fluorescent protein you're gonna use. Uh, I just wanted to point out these two graphs from um, FPBase, which is a fantastic website that gives you all kinds of information about uh, every type of fluorescent protein out there, and, and now they also have um, standard fluorescent dyes as well. But I think a lot of us just kind of go to the well-used, um, EGFP, TD tomato, M cherry, the ones that have been around forever. Um, but there's been so much work done in this area recently. There are so many of these proteins out there and there's ones that may potentially perform much better than those old standards. So I just wanted to point out this um, chart on the left right here. So the x-axis here is emission wavelength. So we're going from blue fluorescent proteins to far red fluorescent proteins in their emission. And then on the left here is their brightness, which is a measure of their extinction coefficient and their quantum efficiency. So basically, um, how good are they at absorbing a photon and how often will they turn that photon in? If, if they absorb one, how often will they emit one? Um, so I actually cut this off at 30. So there's a lot of other fluorescent proteins that would be down here in the lower. But I chose 30 because that's the brightness of EGFP. So you can see EGFP, which we generally consider to be a fairly bright fluorophore, is way down here. And we have some other options that are much, much brighter than that now, um, all across the spectrum. So this is just something to keep in mind. If you're starting from scratch and you have the opportunity to choose your fluorescent proteins that you're going to start with, um, maybe take a look at some of these newer ones. You don't necessarily have to start at the beginning. I'll just point out a couple other things too. Wherever you see these fours or these twos, that means a two means it's a dimer, a four means it's a tetramer. So um, although you have something that might be super bright, you might not want to be sticking a tetramer onto your uh, protein of interest because it might inhibit its functionality. The other thing though to keep an eye out is it doesn't matter how bright a fluorescent protein is um, if it's going to bleach really quickly. And this is really important for live cell imaging because we don't have all those antifade reagents that we can pack into a mounting media and we're in a high oxygen environment inside a cell. Uh, 
Um, so photo stability is really important too. So now if we take a look at the same sort of diagram, uh, we have our emission wavelengths across the bottom, and then we have their bleaching half-life up here. Here we see that this GFP molecule is actually still one of the best as far as photostability. There aren't that many that outperform it. So just because you found something that's super, super bright, make sure it's also photostable. And you'll notice that there's a lot more dots on this side than there are on this side. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem in that we just don't have a lot of this photostability data. So it's easy to get the brightness data, it's harder to get the photostability data, but you should definitely be considering both uh, when you're looking at a live cell imaging experiment. All right. So as far as our antibodies and cell permeable dyes go, um, for all of our microscopes, we're usually looking at the same four similar channels. So a blue, which is usually a nuclear dye, or say Alexa 405 or BD421. Uh, a green dye, let's uh, add O or Alexa 488, a 568 in the orange, and then a 647 in the far red. Um, and so those, I mean, it's the same for fixed cell imaging and live cell imaging. If you have the option to use these dyes, um, most times they're going to be brighter than the fluorescent proteins and they're going to be a little bit more stable. Um, there's different ways to introduce these into your samples. So there's these cell tracker dyes where the dye diffuses into the cell. Once it's inside the cell, uh, it's metabolized into a membrane impermeable form. So once it gets in, it can't get back out. And then you can just wash it off and you've got these cells that are labeled nice and bright and that label stays for a few generations of the cell. Um, like I said before, just watch out. Some nuclear dyes do work in live cells, others don't. So just take a look at the product information ahead of time before you use those. And then I also mentioned these snap clip tags. Um, so these are, again, genetically encoded tags, but they're just very short. It's a short um, polypeptide. It's not an entirely large fluorescent protein that you genetically modify your protein of interest with. And then you can take one of these organic dyes um, that have the chemistry that will bind to it and you just put that on your cell. Uh, again, be careful with the dyes that you use here. Some of them are cell permeable, some of them are not. And some of them that say they are um, might be somewhat, but not very good. Uh, so definitely make sure you talk to someone who's used them before and knows which ones are, are better than others for, for passing through the membrane. Okay, so we've got all of our prep work done. Now we've got to figure out which um, microscope to use. So um, the first question is, should we use an upright or an inverted scope? So in general, with live cell imaging, we're usually always using inverted scopes. Uh, the reason for that is we can get the best environmental control on an inverted microscope. They're definitely better for thin samples um, because we still have to worry about working distances with our, our objectives before we run into the bottom of that dish. Um, and they're also really good for some specialized techniques like, like turf. Um, but sometimes you have samples that just don't grow on glass or you have samples that are very thick like a zebrafish or a drosophila and maybe environmental control is less important like I spoke about earlier. Um, and maybe there's, for some specific reason, you just need to access your sample from, from the top or you can't use a cover slip. Uh, in that case, an upright microscope is gonna work very well for you. Um, in the decision of whether to use a confocal or a wide field, um, I always say use a wide field. Use a wide field with deconvolution. And then if it looks like your sample's too thick, there's too much out of focus light, then go to a confocal. Uh, the advantage of wide field is usually that it's faster um, and it's often more gentle on your sample. So um, always start there. Uh, and then also remember, depending on your sample, light sheet can be a really happy compromise. So often light sheet will give you um, even uh, a more gentle imaging environment than wide field, but it gives you that optical sectioning of confocal and it does it a lot faster. Um, 
the drawback to light sheet is depending on the type of light sheet system you're using, um, you'll get a little more out of focus light. So the image quality can often land somewhere in between a confocal and a wide field system. Um, and then again, just keep in mind how quickly your sample is actually moving, because a confocal uh, might not be able to keep up with it. Which objective are you going to use? Um, I'm just going to put one quick slide in here on this. Uh, just remember what refractive index your sample is sitting in. So when your sample is sitting in essentially water with some salt and some serum in it, it's sitting in a, a refractive index similar to water, so a little over 1.33. You don't want to come in with an oil immersion objective and use oil that has a refractive index of 1.52 you're going to get all kinds of spherical aberration and lose a lot of signal. So in that situation, a water immersion objective or a silicon oil immersion objective or just an immersion objective that has a correction collar is going to be a lot better and a lot more useful for you. Um, I'm not going to dive into this too much because if you go to our YouTube channel, just watch the refraction video that um, I did a few months ago uh, in one of our Lunch and Learns, and it will explain all of this to you there. A couple other things to think about. Um, if you're using one of these uh, objectives on our upright microscopes, they have, so this is a water dipping objective. It's a low magnification, a really high resolution. So it's great for imaging things like zebrafish, um, Drosophila, organoids. Uh, the one thing that you want to keep in mind though is the diameter of this objective is really big. It's almost the same as the diameter of a 35 millimeter plate, okay? It's not quite that big. I think it's um, about 30 millimeters in diameter. So if you are trying to use this objective in one of these wells, you're only gonna be able to image something that's right in the middle. You're not gonna be able to image something on the sides because the objective's gonna bump into the edges. If you're using one of those multi-well plates, the tissue culture multi-well plates that have a millimeter, millimeter and a half thick polystyrene bottom, then you're gonna need a specialized objective that has the working distance to image through that and is corrected for imaging through that. So one of the uh, options are one of these um, long distance objectives. That's what this LD stands for. And it's got a correction color on here, and these markings along the correction color actually refer to the thickness. So this is half a millimeter, one millimeter, I think it goes all the way up to two millimeters. So you can adjust that correction color based on the thickness of the bottom of your polystyrene plate. The cell discoverer actually does this for you. Um, so these are what the objectives inside the cell discoverer look like. Uh, we have four objectives in there. Two of them, including this one right here, will only work with the thin glass bottom multi-well plates, but there's a 5x objective and a 20x objective that do have the working distance to go through these um, thick polystyrene bottom multi-well plates. And the microscope itself will actually measure the bottom thickness and then adjust the uh, objective to, to compensate for that. So it's all fully automated in that system. We also need to make sure that we maintain our focus over time. Um, so due to the thermal drift that's going to be in our microscope as things heat up and cool down, um, what can happen is we can start out being focused on our sample and even over a really short period of time, just six seconds, our entire sample can go out of focus. So our um, LSM 880 with AriScan, our cell discoverer and our Lyra 7, they all use this definite focus system, which is Zeiss's um, autofocus mechanism. And so what happens here is there's a little box on the side of the microscope that holds a infrared LED. That LED passes through a grid um, and gets shone through the objective. So it's projecting some stripes onto your sample. And those stripes are going to reflect wherever there is a refractive index mismatch. So at the bottom of, say, your glass cover slip, before you go into your media that like your sample is sitting in, which is usually a refractive index around water, there's going to be a refractive index mismatch there. 
and that grid is going to get reflected off that surface back into the objective. And then it goes over to this um, camera that's on the side of the microscope. And what the, um, what the system does here is it moves your objective up and down to keep this grid line nice and sharp where it projects onto the sensor chip. Uh, so by that way, it's able to maintain the same amount of distance in between um, the bottom of your sample and the objective over time. Okay. Great. So that's all of our equipment. So let's take a look at our imaging parameters. So the imaging parameters in live cell imaging are really important because as I said before, we don't have our sample um, in a mounting media that we're able to get all the oxygen out of, pack it with antioxidants and make sure that we have all kinds of anti-fade agents there. We don't have to worry about bleaching. We often can't do that in a live cell environment. So there's two things that occur in a live cell environment. And it's bleaching and phototoxicity. And I know I'm guilty of this. I always use these terms interchangeably, um, or I just throw them both out at the same time. But I think it's really important to understand the difference between them. So bleaching is an irreversible change in the chemical structure of a fluorophore. So it's actually breaking bonds in that chemical structure. And it means that fluorophore isn't going to fluoresce anymore. Whereas phototoxicity is the metabolic damage that happens to your cell. And this can be either from the absorption of light, sorry, it is from the absorption of light, but that absorption of light can um, include intrinsic biomolecules, so stuff that's inside your cell, not fluorophores, they can absorb that light, that can cause damage, or it can also be from the free radical production um, that occurs when you bleach a fluorophore that's in your sample. Okay. So um, essentially, Bleaching kills fluorescence, phototoxicity kills your cells. Two different processes, but they can be somewhat linked because the bleaching produces free radicals, which can then cause some phototoxicity, okay? So I think it's always good to keep um, in mind what the difference is there. So what exactly is bleaching? So I told you it's breaking um, a chemical bond within the fluorophore. How does that actually occur? Uh, I know we've shown you a few of these Jablonski diagrams before. This is a, an energy diagram of a fluorescent molecule. So usually our fluorescent molecule is sitting down here in the ground state, and it's just sitting there nice and happy. And then all of a sudden, a photon comes in and gets absorbed. And that takes the electron cloud of that fluorophore and uh, promotes it up to an excited state. So for example, this is a, a green fluorophore here, so it can either absorb one photon of blue light to get up to that excited state, or it can, if you're doing a two photon excitation, it can absorb two photons of infrared light and it gets up to that excited state. Um, it's only in this excited state for a very short amount of time, a few nanoseconds, and then it gives off a photon of green light and falls back to the ground state. But once it's in, when it's in this excited state, there's a couple things that can happen. If it absorbs more energy, it can go to these really high excited states, and that can cause bleaching. If you absorb enough energy um, to break a chemical bond, you can bleach. The other thing that happens quite regularly, we'll talk about this in a second, is something called intersystem crossing, where it goes from this excited singlet state to an excited or to a triplet state. And this triplet state is long-lived. So instead of it being there for nanoseconds, it can be there for microseconds. And while it's in this triplet state, it can again absorb energy. And then this can cause the breaking of bonds and bleaching, all right? So um, absorption and bleaching from an excited singlet state is pretty rare just because this process happens so quickly. But bleaching from the triplet state is quite common because it's uh, fairly long-lived. Okay. So this process of going from uh, a singlet state, this inter-system crossing from a singlet state to a triplet state, 
This happens usually like one to 3% of the time that a fluorophore goes through this cycle. So it doesn't sound like very much. So you wouldn't think that this is a big deal, but because it goes through this cycle so fast and can stay here so long, this can be a problem. And so I'm just gonna give you this one example. And this was Roger Chen wrote this in the confocal handbook. This is an example in a point scanning confocal. So in a point scanning confocal, we're taking a laser beam and we're focusing that laser beam to a tiny point, a 200 nanometer in diameter circle. Um, and so we're really packing a lot of energy in there and a lot of photons, which can excite all of our molecules. So for example, if we had a bunch of fluorescein molecules in the ground state, and let's say each one can absorb this many photons per second, they have an excited single lifetime. So that lifetime of the dye is 4.5 nanoseconds. They cross into that triplet state about 3% of the time. So this is just what I showed you on the last slide. And they reside in that triplet state for a mean time of about one microsecond. The triplet state contains 81% of the fluorophore after only 190 seconds of that laser beam being shined on there. So that means after 190 nanoseconds, you only have about 20% of your fluorophore left but can still give off fluorescence. So if you think about our dwell time of a confocal microscope, it's usually around one or two microseconds. Most of our dye is already in the triplet state almost instantaneously after we hit it, okay? So um, basically what this means is when we're doing live cell imaging, we need to figure out ways to reduce our light dose. So how can we do that? There's three major ways to do it. Um, we can decrease our temporal resolution. So basically just take fewer time points. Obviously this is gonna give less light exposure. We can decrease our excitation light uh, just by turning down the power of our LEDs or our lasers. We can use wide field instead of point scanning. All of these things are gonna give us a lot less light exposure. And the other option is to decrease our spatial resolution. So this is more in the case of a scanning confocal, but we can do fewer pixels, or even in a wide field system, we can do fewer Z slices. Um, and this is gonna give us, sorry, that should say less light exposure. But each of these comes with a bit of a trade-off. So let's, um, for example, say this green dot here is an endosome that's moving in our cell. And it's gonna move from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. And these blue lines represent whenever we're gonna snap a picture, okay? So here goes our molecule moving down. We snap a picture here, snap a picture here. We snapped a picture when we started. So it looks like our molecule moved in a straight line, straight down. But let's repeat this um, with this molecule over here and let's add in some more time points. And now if we snap these images really, really quick, what we see is that molecule is actually moving back and forth, okay? But at the time points that we snapped here, it was right along the midline. So what this means is if you don't take enough um, images temporally, you can actually move, lose or miss some of the motion of your sample. Um, so I think this is pretty straightforward and pretty obvious, but that's obviously something that you're gonna give up if you decrease your temporal resolution. So what happens if we decrease our excitation power? So this is just an example of a mammalian cell that's expressing GFP. And this is just to show you that, hey, look, we can take a thousand images and not bleach our sample at all our signal stayed totally steady that entire time. And the way this was done was by turning the excitation light of that laser down to 0.5% of the max power and turning our gain all the way up. The problem is if you look at this image, you can see it's pretty terrible and it's pretty noisy. Um, so the more we decrease that excitation power, the more of a noisy image we're gonna have to deal with. And sometimes that's okay. Um, 
I stand by the fact that live cell imaging experiments usually give you the most useful, most incredible data, and they're always the ugliest images that ever come off the microscope. And that's totally fine. It's just a matter of getting the data that you need. And if it's noisy as heck, that's fine. You're just gonna have to figure out uh, a way to process it later on. But as long as you get what you need, um, don't worry about how pretty it looks when, when you're doing live cell imaging. And then of course, if we decrease our spatial resolution, um, we obviously can lose a lot of detail. So this is an image of a pollen grain with a really high pixel count. We can see all the spikes on that pollen grain. If you do it with a really low pixel count, you'd be able to tell that there was something there. Um, you'd be able to count pollen grains if that's what you're trying to do, but there's no way you could try and quantitate how many spikes are on the surface of that pollen grain. Okay. So is there anything that we can do to prevent bleaching? So I talked to you a little bit earlier about some of the um, things that we can add to our media. So we can add some of those anti-bleaching agents to our media. We can try those three things that I just showed you earlier or on the last couple slides, decreasing our spatial resolution, decreasing our excitation intensity. Um, but there's, one other trick that we can do um, optically in our microscopes that, that might, at least on our point scanning confocals, that might help you out a little bit. Um, so this is just that same diagram that I showed you earlier. And this was a paper from Stefan Hell's group uh, a while ago. And one of the things that they said was, okay, so all of this bleaching usually happens from the triplet state. And so we know that when we excite our fluorophores, some of them are gonna cross into this triplet state and they're gonna hang out there for about a microsecond before they come back to the ground state. Is there a way that we can excite our fluorophores, but then turn off our excitation light so that they can't absorb anything a second time while they're up here? Um, and if that's the case, if they get excited, they go into the triplet state, as long as there's no more light on the sample, they're not gonna get that second absorption that's gonna cause bleaching. They're just gonna hang out here for a microsecond and then fall down to the ground state. So um, what they did in this paper was they used um, picosecond pulses of light, so that gives you your excitation, but they spaced those um, pulses uh, over a microsecond apart. And what they were able to do was show that that increased your signal quite dramatically. So, this one over here is with um, pulses spaced 25 nanoseconds apart. And this one here is with one microsecond pulses. And you can see you collect a lot more signal. Um, one of the drawbacks to this is obviously this takes a lot longer. So these were done with an equal number of pulses. Um, and so this is a one millisecond acquisition time, whereas this takes 40 milliseconds. So it's 40 times longer when you space out those pulses. So that's one drawback to this. Um, the other question is, can we, how do we do this? Because most of our systems don't have pulsed lasers. All we have are uh, continuous wave lasers. So it just means that we're always hitting our sample um, with light. Well, it doesn't work as well, um, but this was something that was shown a couple years ago by Claire Brown's group at McGill, is if you, crank up your scan speed on a point scanning confocal all the way to the maximum. And you pass across your sample um, more than once and you sum that intensity, so the signal that you get at each one, you can somewhat mimic this. So basically what this means is that our sample is getting hit for 300 nanoseconds with our laser and then it's gonna go away for a while, and then it's gonna come back to that pixel again. And it's gonna be more than a millisecond later. So hopefully some of that fluorophore that's in that triplet state, well, all the fluorophore that's in that triplet state has time to relax. And hopefully we haven't as bleached as much of it that's up there um, by doing it this way. So this is one option, crank up that um, laser scanning speed, turn up your averaging, and then just sum your signal instead of taking a mean average of it. Um, so this might get you a little more uh, signal, a little less bleaching in your live cell sample. But the problem is, is that this um, pixel dwell time, this 300 nanoseconds is still 
um, that's still a little too long. So you're still gonna do some bleaching that way. Uh, if you actually had a pulse laser that like just had um, a pulse length or a pulse width of a, um, 100 picosecond or femtosecond picosecond, you'd be doing better. So I'll show you one other option just because I think it's cool. Um, so the one that I showed you earlier was doing a microsecond wait time in between pulses. The other thing that you can do is use a nanosecond dwell time. Now this is impossible with any Galvo mirrors that we have, they just don't move fast enough. Um, but again, Stefan Hell's group showed this a few years ago. Um, because this process only takes nanoseconds, if you can have your dwell time in the nanosecond range, basically what that means is you're really only um, exciting one or a few fluorophores in each pixel. And then you just keep going over all those pixels a whole bunch of times to build up enough signal. And this has the same impact as doing the microsecond wait times. So you can see this is just looking at um, YFP bleaching. Uh, this is in fixed cells with a continuous wave laser. Um, so if you do a standard slow scan speed, so this is a pixel dwell time of 20 microseconds, you can see this bleaches pretty quickly. But if you use something, they use the special electric, electric tunable lens, which gave them a pixel dwell time of only six, a uh, little over six nanoseconds, you can see you can get a lot more signal um, out of the sample scanning it that way. And then these scan times end up being um, quite similar. Great. So that's everything I wanted to talk to you about today. So we talked about the equipment, um, the different components you need for live cell imaging and, and what we have at the HCBI. We talked about our sample prep, the sort of dishes and plates and media and fluorophores that you need. We talked a bit about choosing the right microscope, whether you're using upright or inverted, which objectives you need. Um, whether you're looking at thick or thin samples or fast or slow dynamics inside your sample. And we looked a bit at the imaging parameters that, that you can play around with to either reduce the light dose on your sample or try and reduce um, your bleaching and, and therefore phototoxicity uh, and what effects that has on image quality. Cool. So if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Um, Otherwise, I suppose we will talk to you next week. Hi, Doug. This is Jen speaking. Um, do you know if there are any considerations for imaging live bacteria as opposed to eukaryotic cells? Yeah, that's a, a really good one. So the, the biggest issue that I've seen with um, imaging bacteria is keeping them happy. Uh, so usually they like to grow on agar, they don't like to grow on glass, and they don't like to be on glass. So we found uh, a couple little tricks. Um, the way we usually like to do this is to take a culture of bacteria, put it onto one of those 35 millimeter dishes with the cover slip bottom, and then just lay an agar pad over top of that. Um, and they usually seem to be pretty happy that way, most bacteria at least, and you can image them for quite a long time. Um, the, there are some strains though that just don't like that at all. Um, and we have found that using the Ibidi plastic uh, bottom, cover slip bottom dishes, uh, some strains like those a lot better than the glass. So exact same prep. Um, just using the plastic instead. And um, the other thing that we've seen is some strains prefer to actually be grown on the agar pad and then just have like a couple microliters of media put onto the dish before you put the um, pad down on top of that. So those are a few of the things that, that we have found worked well. Um, the other is, Bacteria tend to have a lot of autofluorescence in the green region. Um, so doing a lot of imaging with red and far red dyes um, often seems to be a little bit better. Although you also lose resolution there and bacteria is pretty small to begin with. So you don't want to lose too much. <laughs>
small and they don't have a lot of dye. So photo bleaching is also often a problem. Yeah, yeah, find, especially. You find also uh, bacteria that are expressing the likes of GFP or fluorescent protein where the turnover is large. That seems to be less of a problem. But if you have that, that, that one protein complex that is synthesized once and is never replenished, that one is going to go like in the first couple of years. Definitely. <clears throat> Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, hi. Um, I've had some issues in the past where the background changes from frame to frame. Um, so it changes the signal also quite a bit as well. So I was wondering if you have any strategies to mitigate that change? Yeah, so um, oftentimes uh, what that is, if you're using a really thin sample, oftentimes what that is is you're getting a little more or a little less reflection off the cover slip. So it just means that the autofocus of the microscope isn't, I mean, it's never going to be perfect. Um, so even moving uh, a few microns will, if, if you're getting closer to the cover slip, you'll see that. it's. Um, usually worse in the red channel. So if you're doing red channel imaging, if you can shift to a far red or a green, you might see it a little bit less. Um, the absolute best way to get rid of it is just to get your actual signal brighter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, which is always easier said than done. But um, once you get enough signal out of your sample, you, you never notice it after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Because you're doing very fast time points, right? Like, yeah, this isn't, I, yeah. it's not like five minutes between time points or something, right? No, I was, I don't quite know what I want to use yet, but it was between like five milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. Yeah, and is it, um, like it comes and goes, right? Like it's not that it's just continually getting less and less? Yeah, it jumps back and forth from bright to dim. Yeah, because... The other thing that you'll see too is, like I said, there's usually in your media and stuff, there's a lot of um, auto fluorescence there to begin with. And so sometimes what you'll see is you have high background at the beginning. And then if you're doing a lot of frames over and over again really quickly, you'll, you'll actually bleach the auto fluorescence in the media. Um, and so you'll see this slow decrease in your background. But I don't think that's what you're seeing either. I think it's, it's probably, um, because you have some pretty, you have pretty thin samples as well, right? Yeah, just a monolayer of neurons. Yeah, it's probably that you're getting a little more or less reflection off the cover slope. Okay, well, thank you.